Hi there, I'm Azara Tagaya and welcome to another episode of Ring It Sense Plus where we talk about personal finance. Now in the last general election, complaints about the rising cost of living was one of the main issues raised. The new Pakatan Harapan government came to power with the promise of lowering it for the Rakyat. It is now almost a year since Pakatan Harapan has taken over Putrajaya, but there are still complaints from Malaysians about how things are getting more expensive. Now, while the government focuses on helping the lower-income B40 group, the middle-class M40 group are pinched in by having to pay income tax while also faced with the possibility of having subsidies removed in the future. Subsidies they are currently enjoying now, like RON 95 fuel. Now, we met with the Minister of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs, Datuk Sri Saifuddin Nasution Ismail, to ask him about the government's plans to reduce the cost of living in Malaysia. Will they be able to do it fast enough to fulfill everyone's needs? To understand the cost of living, first we have to understand what is the Consumer Price Index or CPI. It measures a basket of goods and services that everyone uses – food, transportation, housing and so on. This is how the government measures the cost of living in Malaysia. The one with the biggest impact for everyone is food, which is why the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs is doing a supply chain analysis to understand why food is Expensive. To me, it's quite shocking, you know, to understand uh, at what level actually the, the, they push up the price. You know, take for example the fishermen; they first sell the f the fish to wholesalers, for example, at uh, six ringgit. When the fish arrive at Putrajaya market, you know, we buy it at twenty two ringgit. So you can see the huge uh, margin there, and then how many layers involved, and at what stage. Uh, actually push the price up. There are at least six clusters. Number one is food. Unfortunately, food itself contributes to up to 30% of uh, weightage on uh, uh, consumer price index. The others are uh, housing and utilities. Another 20%. Okay. And uh, next is uh, cost of transport. You know, this segment contribute at least eighteen percent. So, you take food, housing, and utilities, plus transport, that constitute about seventy percent of the issue of cost of living. Others are education and health, which I think was uh, heavily subsidized by the government. But uh, food itself is thirty percent. That's why you can see that people uh, are very uh, sensitive and you know, critical on the issue of uh, price uh, control, you know. A National Cost of Living Council, or NACOL, has also been set up to help lower the cost of living. One of the suggestions from the council is to find out what consumers are buying at markets. The idea came out when Bank Nagara proposed in the NACOL meeting that KPDNCP has to identify what are the top items uh, of consumers? That means when, uh, when they go to supermarkets or wet markets, what are those items that they have to buy or they buy, you know? Like they push a trolley in the hypermarkets. Uh, they put on, uh, for example, flour, cooking oil, diapers, maggi, uh, you know, could be uh, uh, Milo or whatever, you know? So, if you can identify these 20, 30 top items which consumer must buy when they go for shopping, uh, if you can do some uh, supply chain analysis which involve those items, it will be useful for the government to eventually, number one, whether or not we should put it as a control items. And it can be done under Akta Kawalan Harga and Pencatutan 2011. Or, if uh, there is the issue of supply, for example, and controlled by only one or two segments, uh, which impact uh, in, uh, it, it also involves a cartel when it comes to price fixing, for example. So to understand that, uh, we have to first do some uh, supply chain analysis, which eventually we can put up a proposal uh, to uh, government in the form of cabinet paper or whatnot 
to to make a decision on that. Datuk Sri Saifuddin hopes to complete the supply chain analysis by the third quarter of this year, where they would then make a recommendation to the government on things such as breaking up monopolies and even the possibility of licensing wholesalers. For now, there are temporary measures that the government has rolled out to lower the cost of living, like the National Food Bank program to help university students. There are also currently 386 Consumer Economic Shop Initiatives, or I Keep Stores, nationwide, which sells 195 popular items at lower prices. Unlike the previous Kedai Rakyat Satu Malaysia stores, the government now works with established retailers to operate these stores. We just uh, get them involved, tell them that can you put 195 popular items which consumer must buy whenever they go, they go for shopping, you know, to buy groceries. So uh, other than that, they can sell whatever, how many numbers of stock keeping units they can put it in, the, in, their, in their shop, you know. But please provide some space for this 195. And then I can assure them that they will get enough supply if there is uh, a need to, uh, to, to get the supply of uh, cooking oil, flour, sugar and all that, you know, and they're very happy, they're very happy. That explains why after four months of our launching, uh, the demands, you know, the, the request to put up the uh, iKeep uh, shops uh, is very good, you know. So By the end of the year, the government expects the number of stores to increase to 400. We also asked the minister, will subsidies, such as petrol, be phased out or will there be targeted subsidies? Datuk Sri Saifuddin says that Malaysians currently enjoy subsidies for five consumer items, RON 95 fuel, diesel Euro 2, LPG gas, one kilogram polybag palm cooking oil, and general purpose wheat flour. In Sabah and Sarawak, there are also transportation subsidies to ensure that the prices of essential goods are the same in peninsular Malaysia. The government spends billions subsidizing these items and will be moving towards targeted subsidies, which only the lower income B40 group will enjoy. As it is, many of the subsidies enjoyed by the lower M40 group will eventually be removed. So we wanted to know, what does the ministry have planned? I do agree. Uh, at the moment, the focus is more on B40. Uh, and there is a need to also look into the uh, M40 uh, segment, especially the lower bracket. You know, uh, The idea is, uh, by doing this targeted subsidy, for example, obviously we're going to save a lot of money. Uh, on the part of the government, so that we can extend, we could extend to the M40, uh, especially the lower bracket, as I mentioned, you know. But before we do that, uh, we have to actually uh, make sure that the targeted subsidy program, which we intend to start with RON 95 first, after that we could expand it to a flour, uh, LPG gas or cooking oil, and then at the end of the day, there is some saving to that so that we could use that for the M40. That is the, 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 the real intention of uh, doing the targeted subsidy. Controlling the cost of living is a pretty daunting task for the government to handle and it involves multiple ministries and parties. It's going to take some time before the government finishes its study and rolls out its long-term measures. For now, we recommend consumers to do a monthly budget and have the discipline to stick to it. Well, if you want to watch the full interview with the minister, go to our Facebook page as we will be posting it on there in a bit. Now, before we take a break, let me ask you this question. Do any of you go to classes or to work by motorcycle? And have you thought about what to do if anything ever goes wrong? What happens if you get into an accident? What can you do and what are the steps that you must take? The answers after the break.
Thanks for staying with us on Ringgit Sense Plus, powered by Ringgit Plus. Now imagine this situation. A young man, uh, let's call him Azar, who has been working for three years as a technician, gets into a motorcycle accident on his way to work. He ends up in a private hospital with a broken leg and arm. His medical bills come up to 20,000 ringgit, and his doctor tells him that they have to put a steel bar and six screws into his arm. Now this would mean he has partial disability disability and can't use his arm at work. Luckily for him, his company has medical insurance coverage for him of up to 30,000 ringgit. We asked two licensed financial planners, what can someone like Azar do in a situation like this? Where else can he seek financial assistance? We met with two financial planners to ask them what someone in Azar's situation can do. With regards to Azar's situation, mm -hmm. So, first and foremost, obviously, his initial medical bill will be covered under his company's policy because it's only 20,000 versus 30,000. And generally, even company policies, even in the case of uh, post-treatments, is generally covered up to the limit. So, he can still go for post-treatments up to the 30,000 limit and it's usually per year. Azar can make a claim from the Social Security Organization, or SOCSO, under the Partial Disability Scheme. However, Rafik says he needs to choose wisely on whether he wants to make a claim from the insurance company or SOCSO. Let's say he does uh, exceed the total amount that the company insurance limits provide. So, uh, his first option is actually he can claim from SOCSO. But this is actually then dependent on how he got injured. Mm -hmm. So under the SOCSO's employee, Employment Injury Scheme, uh, if he actually got injured while he was working or while he was on his way to work or on his way from work to home, uh, then the cost of the medical expenses would be covered under SOCSO. Okay, so if that's the case, then he can then go to any SOXO spinal clinic and then get the treatment for free. Uh, he can also go to uh, government uh, hospitals and then I think he can be upgraded to second class wards. So it's not your normal, normal wards. Uh, in addition to that, uh, if he is contributing to EPF, uh, he can actually use his account too. He can use his account too in order to claim uh, for the expenses that is not being covered by anybody else. So it means, let's say, after the company's limit has been fully utilised, uh, so, so, but there are still additional expenses for some reason that he needs to pay, then he can make that claim from uh, EPF. Now, what if Azar wants to purchase medical insurance for himself in the future? Can he still do it even with his disability? Of course, he can still uh, submit for application to be insured by any insurance company in Malaysia. Now, the first principle about insurance is that uh, we, as a consumer, we are obligated to disclose everything about our health that is up to our knowledge to the insurance company because they need this information to assess whether we are considered a standard uh, insured member to the program or not. Uh, why do why do they need that right because when they calculate the premium the cost of insurance is based on a person that is standard y your body everything is normal one so if there is an extra element like a steel plate or whatever in my hand or leg then we have to tell the insurance company which after they get this information they may request for a report to ascertain the current condition that the person it is today then uh, they will issue you an offer. Right? For this kind of condition, usually the outcome should be <coughs> insurance company will exclude any uh, further treatment costs or expenses that is related to that condition. For example, the steel plate may have to be removed one day. So this cost definitely will not be covered. It's very fair. 
According to Kevin, the insurance company will make a proposal to someone like Azar, but they will put in conditions where they will not cover pre-existing conditions like injuries suffered by Azar from his motorcycle accident. For example, if there are any complications arising from the metal plate and screws in his arm, it would be excluded. We also asked Kevin what does partial and permanent disability mean and how it will affect your insurance claim. The terminology permanent and partial disability benefit usually <coughs> is something we will see under personal accident benefits. Um, what it means is that uh, for a person to claim a partial disability benefit, uh, your doctor has to certify that this person cannot do some of the work. All right. That means if let's say uh, I'm a, I'm a writer, I use my brain and I use both of my hands to type. So let's say just one one finger or one hand is not convenient to do the work, but I still have another hand. It can consider some of the work I still can do. I'm not totally. Uh, have to sit at home and do nothing. So this is considered a partial disability situation, whereas permanent disability situation is whereby totally cannot do any work during that recovery period. Um, so when you buy personal accident policy or even uh, add on a personal accident rider to your life insurance policy, you for personal accident general insurance part first, um, consumer has the option to choose whether they want to include this kind of benefit into their policy or not. Okay, it will add on a bit of premium. Then the rate is usually set. Let's say uh, one week of disability, it's a hundred ringgit. So if the doctor says you are unable to work for two weeks, then 200 it is. It's based on the assessment of the doctor, right? If uh, let's say it says two weeks and then two weeks later, it's still not recovered. You have to go back to the doctor for the assessment. And then he, based on their professional opinion, they will say, okay, you need another week. And you can claim for another week. Okay, under the life insurance part, the rider under uh, for personal accident, um, if they if it is a comprehensive personal accident rider, they will usually cover permanent disability and partial disability benefit. It will be based on a formula or a percentage on how much you buy the insured amount. To sum it up, Kevin says at the very least, consider having two types of insurance, medical insurance and personal accident coverage. If you get into an accident or have a serious illness, the medical insurance will help cover your medical bills. However, once you're out of the hospital and have some form of disability, like a broken arm and can't work, then your personal accident insurance will step in to help replace lost income. If you often ride a motorcycle, consider getting these two types of insurance as soon as you can afford it. Well, hopefully you guys picked up a thing or two from that segment. And to watch it again, you can always go to our Facebook page. Now we're going for another break and when we come back, we'll be talking to our partners Ringgit Plus about health insurance. Stay tuned for that and we will see you after the break. Welcome back to Ringgit Sense Plus, the show where we talk about personal finance. And as promised, in this part of the show, we'll be talking about health insurance. Now, for this segment, we usually take in questions from the viewers. And just to clarify, sometimes we change some basic information like the person's name or age so that it becomes more of a general question. But the scenario remains the same. So to help us answer this week's question, we have with us in the studio, Lucas Uy, Director of Insurance at Ringgit Plus. Hi, Hi. Lucas. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you very much for having me. Okay, so this week we have a question from our viewer. Uh, he's a guy, his name mm -hmm. is Yusuf, and he's wondering about health insurance. So um, he actually has a plan with his company, but he's thinking, uh, does he have to top up this insurance plan and is it necessary to uh, go to a different company or can they just top up with the same company that the, the office is offering? Okay, um, let me just give you a quick rundown. Mm -hmm. um, I think the most important thing with insurance is making sure uh, the, the, the benefits and the coverage are the most suitable for, for the needs of the, of, the, of the person and the individual. So if the company has the enough benefits uh, that covers the, the, the person, then that's great. Of course, um, if, if, typically companies don't offer the greatest coverage because yeah. um, 
Um, corporate uh, uh, insurance is usually a group policy and there are quite a lot of limitations uh, or at least um, this, uh, uh, the coverage is not as high as individual policy. So it's good that this person is looking for uh, alternative uh, insurance uh, um, that's uh, on top of the company. Because who knows, he might not even be at the current company that he's working at. Mm. So that's great. Uh, the second thing is um, some companies do offer a top-up service uh, uh, where there is a special uh, uh, deal with the company and the insurer to offer additional benefits on top of the corporate plan, mm -hmm. uh, which means that there are potentially good savings there because then you don't have to uh, start with a new policy. It's just an additional top up. It also means that you may not have to go through all your medical questions again, mm -hmm. uh, do all your medical checks, underwriting questions. So it's also maybe a bit more convenient for the, for the person to buy additional top up. But I think the most important thing is really making sure uh, even the top-up plan is enough uh, uh, for, the, for the customer. And if it's not, that's where he may prefer to go and speak to either an agent or an FA or, or, altern or that with the di insurance directly mm. uh, uh, plan. Yeah. Okay. Now, some people think that you already have uh, the insurance that your office is offering, so that's enough for now because mm. uh, they may not have any uh, health problems as of yet. So, mm. what would be your advice to them? Okay. Well, if, you, if, if the person is really healthy, I think that's a really good sign. Mm. Um, I think uh, it's much easier to get insurance when you are healthy versus when you're not healthy. Mm. So, uh, it's always uh, most important to to get enough coverage. If the person believes that the company offers enough, uh, I mean, that's better than nothing. But ultimately, uh, you may not be at this company forever. Mm. So uh, the important thing is to get your own policy so you're covered no matter which company you work for. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, um, tell us a little bit about how the claims process actually works for health insurance. What, what are the steps that you have to take? I mean, there are many uh, uh, types of claims that you can make, but typically let's talk about hospitalization. Mm -hmm. This is where uh, when you go to, uh, when you have an accident or you're at home or you, uh, you don't feel well and, and you get hospitalized, mm -hmm. uh, typically you will carry around your medical card. Uh, so a in the case of a company insurance, they will give you a company uh, medical card. Mm -hmm. You just take this to a panel hospital. Make sure you know which hospitals are on the panel of the insurance policy that you have. Mm -hmm. So then you can be automatically admit, uh, admit, uh, 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 entered into the, uh, uh, into the hospital and you don't actually have to pay for anything. Mm -hmm. So health insurance covers the cost of all your bills of staying in the hospital, um, uh, 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 treatment as well and doctor's coverage. Um, so you don't actually have to pay any money up front. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so let's say you have both, one, uh, your yeah. company card and you have a personal health insurance. Which okay. one should you take out first if you're in the hospital? Okay, that's a really interesting question. Um, it really depends. Uh, I would say uh, the one that gives you the least amount of uh, uh, hassle, right? Mm. So what does that mean? Um, sometimes your personal insurance medical card or health card is not the same br uh, company mm. as your as mentioned earlier about the, the corp company one. Mm -hmm. So uh, make sure the one which is the panel hospital is being covered by the medical card. Mm -hmm. That means you don't have to fork up any money up front. Mm -hmm. Secondly, um, what's more convenient? If you already have a personal insurance and you know you have someone to help you uh, with your claims process, even after treatment or post hospitalization, pick your personal because then you have someone by your side mm -hmm. to help you complete the claims process. I mean, typically, people don't really want to do too much work when they're hospitalized. Yeah. So having that person next to you to help you with your claim is probably the most important thing. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you so much for giving us clarification on health insurance this week. Uh, as always, it's fun to have you guys from Ringgit Plus to help us with our sure. questions. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. You. Well guys, uh, that's the episode for this week and uh, if you want to watch some videos from our show, as always, go to our Facebook page and you can connect with us there. That's also where you can watch all the segments from today's show as we will be posting them online as well in a bit. And uh, I'm Azara Tagaya signing off. We will see you again next time and remember to invest and save wisely.